Here we have to understand that uh, when we talk about upper limb, there will be skin, some of the connective tissue, like you have the bones, the tendons, then you'll have the muscles, nerves, arterial supply, venous drainage. There is an axis also for the upper limb, so there will be a preaxial area, postaxial area. But all that begins with the three germ layers. So, for example, if you say skin, epidermis, the epithelium, it is from surface ectoderm. But if you say the dermis, then it will be from mesoderm. But then mesoderm itself is uh, subdivided into certain components, like there will be axial mesoderm, then paraaxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, lateral plate mesoderm. So, which of these will be giving us the skin dermis or the muscles? Or the bones because each of these individual entities have a separate origin. Let us look at a diagram for the same purpose showing different layers of mesoderm. Now regarding the mesoderm, what you are looking at is a transverse section of the embryo during development and there is a dorsal cavity which you see here in yellow color the amniotic cavity and then there is a ventral cavity which is known as the yolk sac cavity which you see here the yolk sac cavity and then develops a third cavity which is all around and it is called coelomic cavity which you can see partly here the intra embryonic coelomic cavity and you can see it is coming onto the other side as well intra embryonic coelomic cavity so basically we are having three cavities now one is the intra embryonic coelomic cavity and the other one is the yolk sac cavity which is ventral and then there is a amniotic cavity then there will be three germ layers ectoderm the dorsal mesoderm the middle and endoderm the lower say for example the amniotic cavity is having the ectoderm at the floor and the yolk sac cavity is having endoderm at the roof and between the endoderm and the ectoderm you have got the mesoderm our focus here is on the mesoderm see here we have got the axial mesoderm which is also called as the notochord and then on the side what is also referred to as para there is para axial mesoderm now this para axial mesoderm on the side of axial mesoderm is going to form the somite and somite itself will be dividing into certain components one is the myotome and it is the myotome in this region which come from the somite will be actually forming the skeletal muscles like if you are talking about biceps brachii or triceps brachii or any muscle in the limb region maybe upper limb maybe lower limb the appendicular musculature that is skeletal muscles skeletal muscles are coming from the somite so basically para axial mesoderm but it is not going to give us the bones and where are the bones like uh, humerus bone or radius ulnar bone coming from for that you have one more mesoderm which is uh, called as the lateral plate mesoderm so here we have got lateral plate mesoderm and uh, you can show it having further divided into two parts due to that uh, intra embryonic coelomic cavity so lateral plate mesoderm as you see has a dorsal component and a ventral component now what is this uh, dorsal component called it is called a somatic lateral plate mesoderm as you can see here and then what about the ventral ventral is called as the visceral or splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm so here we have the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm then you have to remember it is the dorsal somatic lateral plate mesoderm which is going to give us the bones like we said humerus bone radius ulna bone or whichever bones of upper limb lower limb appendicular skeleton come from the dorsal somatic lateral plate mesoderm which is lying dorsal to the coelomic cavity as we have seen here so muscles will be coming from the paraxial mesoderm whereas the bones will be coming from the lateral plate mesoderm the right upper limb the left upper limb then let us have an overview of the nerve supply coming to the upper limb region. As we understand, there is a central nervous system and there is a peripheral nervous system. And upper limb will be getting some nerves in the peripheral nervous system. Let us have a look at a diagram for the details. Seen as the central nervous system means 
we have to include the brain and the spinal cord whereas if we are talking about the cranial nerves coming from the brain or the spinal nerve coming from the spinal cord they are considered as peripheral nervous system so cranial nerves and the spinal nerves since we are focusing upon the upper limb which is controlled by the spinal nerves where are uh, these nerves coming from in the spinal cord there is an enlargement in the cervical region cervical enlargement and then there is a lumbosacral enlargement the lumbosacral enlargement is for the lower limb nerve supply whereas the upper limb which we are focusing upon right now will be getting a brachial plexus from cervical enlargement now the cervical enlargement itself has a root value coming from the spinal cord segment cervical 3 and reaching the thoracic 2 spinal segment now in that cervical enlargement within that range five root values are coming for brachial plexus and the root values start with phi c phi then you will have 6 7 8 and uh, t1 total five root values lying within this range of cervical 3 and thoracic 2. Sometime it can be a prefix brachial plexus or it could be a postfix brachial plexus. Let us talk about that as well. So as we say the brachial plexus which is uh, coming from the anterior primary ramus having five root values starting with phi the c phi reaching thoracic 1 but then in addition to this uh, c5678 and t1 if you are getting c4 included in the brachial plexus for the upper limb then you will say pre fixed brachial plexus and if you are getting the next t2 root value into the brachial plexus then you will say post fixed brachial plexus some individual variations can be there but usually most of the individual will have c5 to t1 root value to take care of the upper limb region may it be the skin muscles or the other connective tissue now this brachial plexus begins in the neck region and uh, the axons will be passing behind the bone clavicle to enter the axilla region also what you see is there will be roots and trunks in the neck region whereas the divisions will be passing behind the bone clavicle and then you will have cords and branches in the axilla so what you find in the axilla will be cords and branches we'll be discussing the brachial plexus in two parts if we are talking about the roots and the trunks in in the neck region and if you're talking about the cords and branches then in the axilla region so let us have an overview here you'll find in the neck region roots c5678 t1 will be seen and these are nothing but some collection of axons coming from the spinal cord then c5 c6 roots will join in the neck region to form the upper trunk of brachial plexus whereas the middle value that is c7 will continue as the middle trunk of the brachial plexus you will find them in the neck region and then there'll be a lower trunk also which is contributed by lower values C8 T1. So this is going to be the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. This is the middle trunk. So there will be three trunks of brachial plexus in the neck region. Now each of them will give uh, one anterior and one posterior division. So there will be three anterior and three posterior divisions. Total six nerve bundles passing behind the bone clavicle to enter the axilla. In the axilla they will be forming the three cords of the brachial plexus namely lateral cord posterior cord and medial cord and their naming is in relation to the axillary artery in the axilla we have axillary artery if the cord lies lateral to that lateral cord of brachial plexus if it is lying medial to the axillary artery you will say medial cord of brachial plexus and if the cord is lying behind the axillary artery then it is posterior cord of the brachial plexus and we'll be talking about them in detail giving some branches also in the axilla region but this was just an overview to mention that roots and trunks are in the neck region divisions passing behind the clavicle bone and then cords and branches are seen in the axilla the branches we'll be focusing upon are named as with the radius bone radial nerve with the ulna bone ulna nerve and one running in the midline the median nerve so three nerves basically though there are more than three we have to talk about but three nerves which are evident here 
and three cords which will be evident in the axilla and three trunks which will be evident in the neck region. This is just an oversimplification of the details. Then we need to talk about some of the dermatomes and the myotomes in the upper limb because when there are lesions, there will be particular segments of the skin which can have sensory disturbances or particular movements which will be affected depending upon which root value has been compromised or which nerve has been compromised and which level was it proximal damage or the lesion was distal. Developmentally, it is seen that the thumb is going to have a proximal disposition embryologically as compared with the little finger. And that is why the thumb will have a proximal dermatome and the little finger will have distal dermatome. It is going to happen in the lower limb as well. The great toe will have proximal dermatome root value and the little toe will have distal dermatome. We'll talk about the lower limb later, but here, remember, in the upper limb, the middle three fingers, they are having the middle values. The middle three fingers will have the middle value of brachial plexus, which is C7. Now, when you say that C7 is the dermatome of the three fingers, the middle three fingers, what about the proximal thumb? It'll be proximal root value. And what is that? Before C7, we have C6. So the thumb has C6 dermatome. What about the little finger? That will be distal. Distal root value means, means after C7, we have got C8. So it is mentioned in some books very precisely, but most of the books they show variations. And what we find is the upper limb buds are appearing by the end of the fourth week during development, whereas the lower limb buds appear one or two days later. That'll be the beginning of the fifth week. So there is just a difference of one or two days between the appearance of the upper limb bud, lower limb bud. Now, upper limb was pulling the phi root values, starting with phi, that is C5, and then 6, 7, 8, T1, and the there is a particular arrangement embryologically. As we have mentioned, the middle three fingers, they get the middle value of brachial plexus C7, whereas thumb is proximal pre-axial. So there is a pre-axial border where you will find the thumb or the radius bone and C6 dermatome, whereas there'll be a post-axial border where you can consider the ulna bone or the little finger. There you have C8 dermatome. And if you come to the lateral elbow, then it will be still more proximal C5. And if you go to the medial elbow, then it will be the distal root value that is T1. See the importance of knowing these dermatome is if there is pulling of the upper trunk of brachial plexus C5-6 root value involved, then there will be sensory disturbance in the lateral elbow and the thumb region that is C5, C6, dermatome is involved. But if there is a pulling of the lower trunk of brachial plexus, which is clump case palsy, C8, T1, then uh, C8 is the little finger, post axial area, and T1 is the medial elbow. So there'll be sensory disturbance in the little finger and the medial elbow region in clump case palsy. Of course, along with some motor disturbances also, which we need to discuss further. Embryologically, if it is the proximal muscles like the shoulder, the scapular muscles, they'll have proximal root value. For example, C5-6, as you can see, if we are doing shoulder abduction using the proximal muscles like shoulder scapular muscles, it'll be C5 root value. And if you come to the arm region, say you want to flex the elbow, then it'll be C5-6 myotome. See, my point is in Arab's palsy, when C5-6 root value is involved, there'll be difficulty in shoulder abduction and elbow flexion, leading to some particular deformity like polish band hip hand deformity, which we need to discuss further. But on the other hand, if it was a clump case palsy, then which group of muscles will be involved? And there you can mention C8-T1 is distal root value so distal musculature will be involved. The hand muscles will be involved. For example, if you want to fold the fingers, C8 root value, and if you want to spread close the fingers, which is uh, interosseous working here, T1 root value. So in clump case palsy, there will be difficulty in spreading, closing the fingers, T1, and of course, C8 is also involved. So distal musculature is involved in clump case palsy, the hand muscles, and in arms palsy, the proximal musculature is involved, which is the arm muscles, 
muscles, shoulder, scapular muscles. Then it was polished by hand deformity and in some case palsy it will be known as claw hand deformity. Coming up further, we should also know that during development, the upper limb is going to rotate laterally by 90 degree so that what happens is the thumb will be coming to the lateral side in anatomical position. So thumbs are placed laterally as compared with the, the great toe. Since the lower limb are rotating exactly opposite medially by 90 degree, so great toe will be now coming towards the medial side as you will observe here in the anatomical position. The great toe is on the medial side. There is a total difference of 180 degree in the final adult position. And that is why for the upper limb, the flexor compartment or the folding compartment comes anteriorly. As you can see, the upper limb folds anteriorly. Whereas if you are talking about the lower limb, the folding compartment or flexor compartment goes posterior embryologically. It is evident here as well. If you are folding the upper limb, the flexor compartment for upper limb is on the front anterior side. Whereas for the lower limb, the folding compartment, flexion compartment is on the posterior side like uh, posterior thigh muscles are involved in knee flexion and posterior leg region that is calf muscles are involved in plantar flexion of the ankle and the toes. But since our focus remains on the upper limb, the anterior arm and forearm muscles are flexors of the elbow, wrist or the fingers whereas the posterior compartment is uh, the compartment of uh, extension like posterior arm muscle will cause elbow extension, posterior forearm muscle will cause extension at the wrist joint or the metacarpophalangeal interphalangeal joint. So these are some of the basics which we need to remember. Developmentally, when it comes to the arteries and the veins, let us focus upon the arteries. For the upper limb, there will be intersegmental artery number 7, which is contributing to the subclavian artery. And further you will see, there are brachial arteries in the arm region, radial and lunar arteries in the forearm region, palmar arches in the hand region, further developing. So primary axial artery, which is intersegmental artery number 7, is further giving branches and uh, depends whether you are in the arm region, then brachial, if it is on the interosseous membrane, interosseous artery, and with the ulna, ulnar artery with the radius, radial artery, and then there'll be some palmar arches also. Let us focus upon this now, where we are looking at the subclavian artery under the clavicle bone and coming from intersegmental artery number seven, embryologically. When it comes to axilla, you change the name into axillary artery. And then you can mention when it comes to arm region, you will call it as the brachial artery. And uh, then brachial artery will be dividing into radial ulnar artery. Understand, the radial artery is the pre-axial artery towards the thumb, towards the radius bone, whereas the ulnar artery is post-axial artery towards the ulnar bone and little finger. Then which artery is going to be the axial artery? The axial artery is actually anterior interosseous artery lying on the anterior aspect of interosseous membrane between radius and ulna bone. So anterior interosseous artery is the axial artery here running in the midline. Later we will talk about the superficial palm arch, the palm arch details as well. But here embryologically, if a vein is running with the radius bone, then it is pre-axial vein. And if it is running with the ulna bone, then it is post-axial vein. Let us see that in the next diagram. Basically, there is one anterior axial line developmentally and uh, it is reaching the wrist joint level and there is a posterior axial line on the posterior aspect of the upper limb. Now, if you are talking about radius bone or the thumb region or the radial artery, they are all pre-axial structures. And then you can say running with the pre-axial border with the radius bone is the cephalic vein. So cephalic vein is a pre-axial vein which starts 
on the dorsum of the hand, runs on the roof of the anatomical snuff box, and then keep running on the lateral aspect of the forearm region. So, cephalic vein, if it is a preaxial vein, which is the postaxial vein, the postaxial vein is uh, running at the base of the forearm, known as the basilic vein. So, postaxial finger is the little finger, and postaxial bone is the ulna bone, and a vein running with ulna bone is basilic vein. So, basilic vein is postaxial vein. Just some embryological overview here. Moving on to the details of the brachial plexus, we will be first focusing upon the trunks and then the cords as well. As we have mentioned earlier, the roots and the trunks will be seen in the neck region, whereas if we are talking about the divisions, they'll be passing behind the bone clavicle and when we reach the axilla, they will find the cords and the branches. Now, cords and branches along with divisions will be the next part of the discussion presently. We will focus upon the trunks, specifically upper trunk and the lower trunk. So, they are going to be presenting in the neck region and can be pulled if upper trunk is pulled of palsy results and if lower trunk is pulled then clump case palsy may result. It is the root value C5 and C6 axons coming from the spinal cord which are joining to form the upper truncobrachial plexus and which is also called as superior truncobrachial plexus. Whereas the middle trunk has the middle root value of brachial plexus which is C7 and it is continuing as the middle trunk of brachial plexus here. And then the lower root values that is C8 and T1, these axons will be joining to form the lower trunk of brachial plexus which is also called as the inferior trunk of brachial plexus. Among the three trunks only the upper trunk will be giving branches. There are two branches. One goes above scapula called suprascapular nerve here. And then we have got another branch coming under the clavicle which is to supply a muscle under clavicle called as nerve to supply clavius whereas the suprascapular nerve coming from the upper trunk will be supplying some scapular muscles and even before the trunk was giving some branches already two nerves have come up from the brachial plexus say there's a dorsal scapular nerve going dorsal to scapula coming from the root of C5 directly as you can observe here and there is a long thoracic nerve to serratus anterior muscle which is also coming directly from the roots, the roots of C567 as you can witness here. So it is the C5 and the C6 and the C7 contributing to long thoracic nerve to serratus anterior. Now let us continue with the upper trunk of brachial plexus which is further dividing into anterior division and the posterior division. In fact, each trunk is supposed to divide into two divisions. And uh, we can discuss an arms point here. Arms point is present in the neck region and six nerves are to be discussed, which will be the root of C5 and the root of C6 and the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius and the anterior division of upper trunk and posterior division of upper trunk. So these six nerves may be involved in pulling of the upper trunk, arps, palsy, the six nerves, I'll repeat again, root of C5, root of C6, the suprascapular nerve, nerve to subclavius, anterior division and posterior division of upper trunk. This will lead to paralysis of proximal muscles like shoulder muscle, scapular muscle, arm muscle and Polish band tip hand deformity. Plus there will be some sensory loss we have discussed earlier on the lateral aspect of the upper limb bearing the dermatome C5 and C6. So let us look at one of such a patient and then we can compare it with clump case palsy involvement of C8 T1 as well. Understand that if there is a lesion at the arms point then some of the nerves will be spared working normally and one of them will be long thoracic nerve to serratus anterior. Since the lesion is distal it will not be affecting already given proximal nerves. What I mean to say is Serratus anterior keep working normally in a case of uh, palsy if the lesion was at herbs point. 
So here we are looking at a case of uh, uh, palsy. We understand the nerves involved will have the root value C5 and C6, which are suprascapular nerve, as we mentioned earlier, but also any nerve having these exons of C5, 6 could be the axillary nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, and a partial injury of uh, radial nerve also, though radial nerve has all the five root values of brachial plexus, but uh, the C5, 6 component will be affected. So it will be a partial injury of radial nerve. Some of the muscles will be paralyzed and some of the muscles will be still working. And that's what is the problem. If a particular set of muscles are working and another set of muscles are not working, then comes a deformity and that is what we need to discuss here. Before that you can mention what could be the causes, the etiology in our palsy. Maybe it was a case of birth injury, undue separation of head and shoulder, pulling of the upper trunk of brachial plexus which can also happen in sports injuries, fall on shoulder, undue separation of head and shoulder, pulling of the upper trunk, leading to a palsy and Polish man append deformity. You may remember I have mentioned the C5, C6 root value is for the proximal muscles, like shoulder abduction will not be possible. If shoulder abduction is not happening, then the adductor muscles will be becoming more powerful and the shoulder joint remains in A double D adduction deformity, number one. Number two, the lateral rotators have been compromised. So the medial rotators become more powerful and shoulder remains in medial rotation. Number three, the elbow joint flexion is a problem. So extensors are more powerful and it goes into extension. And then you can mention the supinators with root value C5, 6 have been compromised. So the hand remains in prone posture. This particular posture where the shoulder is in adduction and medial rotation and the elbow joint is in extension whereas the radial nerve joints are in pronation is known as punishment tip hand deformity. It is paralysis of muscles supplied by axillary nerve which is deltoid for shoulder abduction and teres minor for lateral rotation. So shoulder abduction, lateral rotation is compromised. That is why shoulder remains in medial rotation and in adduction. Plus muscular cutaneous nerve has been compromised which supplies the muscles like biceps brachii which is a powerful supinator. So supination and elbow flexion that is the function of uh, biceps. Elbow flexion compromised that is why elbow remains in extension and supination has been compromised that is why the radial nerve joint remains in prone posture. So paralysis of biceps brachii due to involvement of muscular cutaneous the root value C5, C6 chiefly. Plus there'll be sensory loss as we mentioned. Axillary nerve is supplying the skin on the lower part of deltoid. There'll be a sensory loss called as regimental batch anesthesia. And there is sensory loss on the thumb also. Number two number C6. On the anterior side, the median nerve and on the posterior side, the radial nerve. There's a partial injury of radial nerve as well as the median nerve involving C6 root value. That is why sensory disturbance on the thumb may be posterior side radial nerve territory or anterior side, the median nerve territory. Then we can talk about the clump case palsy also, which is uh, pulling of the lower trunk of brachial plexus, root value CAT1 and the distal root value distal muscles, that is the hand muscles will be compromised. There will be a partial injury of median nerve bearing root value CAT1 and uh, a lower nerve and there can also be involvement of T1 sympathetic pathetic fiber. If that happens in clump case palsy, there will be features of Horner syndrome. Since the muscle, superior tarsal muscle, part of Miller muscle has T1 sympathetic root value has been compromised. Also, the dilator pupillae with the T1 sympathetic value has been compromised, resulting in meiosis due to unopposed activity of sphincter pupillae and the partial tosis also. So that partial tosis is due to paralysis of uh, superior tarsal muscle, mirror muscle, and uh, meiosis is due to paralysis of dilator pupillae muscle. Features of uh, Horner syndrome may accompany clump case lesion. Now the etiology for clump case palsy is again birth injury. 
There is a difficult labor. You are trying to pull the baby out, and there is hyper abduction injury at the shoulder joint. Pulling of the lower trunk of brachial plexus, or it may be a boy falling from the tree trying to hold a branch, and again hyper abduction injury. Pulling of the lower trunk of brachial plexus, and that will lead to claw hand deformity. The lumbrical and interosseous muscles have been compromise see normally the lumbrical and interosseous muscle together they can perform mcp flexion metacarpo pharyngeal joint flexion and interphalangeal extension and they are balancing the anterior posterior forearm muscles normally but if there is a case of clump case palsy cat1 root value injury lumbrical interosseous are compromised so forearm muscles become more powerful now since the lumbrical interosseous are not balancing them it is the posterior forearm muscle like extensor digitorum which will be causing hyper extension deformity at mcp joint and then the anterior forearm muscle especially flexor distorum profundus will be causing interphalangeal flexion so as i told one group of muscle become more powerful causing the deformity if the other group of muscle have been compromised if lumbrical interosseous bearing cat1 cannot do mcp flexion interphalangeal extension then the anterior forearm muscles have become more powerful bringing the deformity flexor distorum profundus for finger flexion and extensor distorum is now unopposed causing metacarpophalangeal extension and that is what you call as claw hand deformity we'll discuss it later as well and then there'll be some sensory loss where the c8 t1 and what is c8 the little finger side ulnar nerve territory and also the medial elbow sensory loss will be there in clump case palsy and then we can move on to the three cords of brachial plexus which will be seen in the axilla now how they are formed and how they are named we need to discuss again as we have mentioned earlier the upper trunk middle trunk and lower trunk are in the neck region each giving one anterior division and one posterior division so there will be total six divisions passing behind the bone clavicle you are going to focus upon those six divisions now so you start with the trunk region this is the upper trunk of brachial plexus which is also called superior trunk of brachial plexus shown here and now it is giving us one anterior division which will be passing behind the bone clavicle and one posterior division as well so this is going to be the posterior division similarly we'll find the middle trunk is giving anterior and posterior division let us show that as well so here is the middle trunk of brachial plexus giving the anterior division and it is also going to give us the posterior division you can see that the posterior division of middle trunk is joining the posterior division of the upper trunks in the similar fashion as the anterior division of the middle trunk was joining anterior division of the upper trunk so they keep happening some combination and recombination of axons behind the clavicle bone before they can enter the axilla to form the cords now what about the lower trunk of brachial plexus in the neck region which is also called inferior trunk of brachial plexus even the inferior trunk of brachial plexus is going to give us the two divisions passing behind the bone clavicle so here is the anterior division of the lower trunk of brachial plexus and that is the posterior division of the lower trunk of brachial plexus now remember the posterior division of the lower trunk middle trunk and the upper trunk they will join behind the bone clavicle to continue as the posterior chordobrachial plexus which is present in the axilla region so posterior chordobrachial plexus has been contributed by posterior division of the upper trunk and 
posterior division of the middle trunk and posterior division of the lower trunk. What about the anterior divisions? The anterior division of the upper and middle trunk, they have joined. And what are they doing? After that, they will form the lateral cordobrachial plexus in the axilla region. And what else is left? It was the anterior division of the lower trunk. So what happens to anterior division of the lower trunk? The anterior division of lower trunk will continue continue as the medial cordobrachial plexus in the axilla region. So in the axilla region, we have three cordobrachial plexus named according to the axillary artery and they'll be giving several branches in the axilla. Say for example, medial cordobrachial plexus in the axilla continues as the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is the continuation of the medial cordobrachial plexus, which itself is continuation of the anterior division of the lower trunk of brachial plexus. Hence, will be bearing the root value C8 and T1. But again, it is going to be an oversimplification because there are still further details. But anyhow, C8 T1 roots joining to form the lower trunk of brachial plexus, giving the anterior division, giving us the medial cord of brachial plexus, giving us ulnar nerve is quite a good overview of the formation of ulnar nerve. Then what about the radial nerve formation? If you say radial nerve formation, then let us trace it. Actually, radial nerve is the continuation of the posterior cord of brachial plexus. It has all the five root values of brachial plexus. And how come that is happening? See, radial nerve is continuation of the posterior cord of brachial plexus is contributed by posterior division of all the three trunks of brachial plexus and which themselves will have five root values. So five root values of brachial plexus contributing to the trunks and posterior divisions and the posterior cord and the nerve of the posterior compartment that is radial nerve. Then how the median nerve is formed? How the muscular cutaneous nerve is formed? You will notice that the lateral cord of brachial plexus will be continuing as the muscular cutaneous nerve and that is why muscular cutaneous nerve which is continuation of the lateral cord of brachial plexus contributed by anterior division of the upper middle trunk will be bearing the root value C5, 6 and 7. So muscular cutaneous nerve has three root values which is C5, 6, 7 because that came into the upper trunk and the middle trunk and then anterior divisions and then lateral cord of brachial plexus and then the muscular cutaneous nerve having root value C5, 6, 7. Then how come this axillary nerve which is coming from the the posterior cord of brachial plexus. Normally, it should have all the five root values. How come it has only C56? Why it is not having C567, C81 like radial nerve? Because not all the axons are carried by this nerve. Axi nerve is a small nerve and it's a proximal nerve and will carry only proximal root values. Though it is coming from the posterior cord of brachial plexus, which has all the five root values, it will receive only the proximal C56 axons, whereas the radial nerve receives all the five axons. Then what will be the root value of median nerve? Median nerve, like radial nerve, has all the five root values. But how come median nerve has all the five root values of brachial plexus, just like radial nerve? Let us look at some more details then in the next diagram. So we are focusing upon the right upper limb here in the axilla you'll have the axillary artery and in relation to axillary artery there are three cords of brachial plexus in the axilla lateral cord, middle cord and posterior cord in relation to this axillary artery and as we have discussed earlier as well the posterior division of three trunks of brachial plexus, they were joining to form the posterior cord of brachial plexus. And this posterior cord of brachial plexus continues posterior to the artery called as the 
axillary artery and then continues as the radial nerve. So radial nerve which lies posterior to axillary artery is continuation of the posterior chordobrachial plexus which is continuation of posterior division of the three trunks of brachial plexus. Then what happens to the medial chordobrachial plexus? The medial chordobrachial plexus which is shown here lying medial to the axillary artery is going to continue as the ulnar nerve here. So ulnar nerve is the continuation of the medial cord of the brachial plexus. Now if you say so, what else the medial cord is going to contribute here? That we will find out. But here we have known about ulnar nerve. And now we are supposed to discuss about the lateral cord of brachial plexus which is going to lie lateral to the axillary artery. So this is the lateral cord of brachial plexus in the axilla lying lateral to the axillary artery and continuing as the musculocutaneous nerve in the axilla. So this is the musculocutaneous nerve lying lateral to axillary artery continuation of the lateral cord of brachial plexus. Then what else it is doing? Now you will notice formation of the median nerve and how the median nerve is formed. Median nerve is contributed by not only lateral cord but also the medial cord of brachial plexus. So see here we have got the median nerve which is contributed by two sources and what are those two sources? From the medial cord of brachial plexus and also the lateral cord of brachial plexus as you see here. So lateral cord of brachial plexus and medial cord of brachial plexus contributing to the median nerve which keep running in the midline. Now if the median nerve keep running in the midline then where is the ulnar nerve running? Ulnar nerve is the continuation of the medial cord of brachial plexus run medially along with the ulnar bone. So ulnar nerve is running with the ulnar bone. Then what about the radial nerve? Radial nerve is the nerve of posterior compartment and runs with the radius bone. The radial nerve passes behind the humerus bone in radial groove and then follows the radius bone. So that is the course of the radial nerve. Continuation of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. So these are some of the briefings which we needed to understand here. Axillary nerve is a branch from the posterior cord of brachial plexus. Actually posterior cord will be giving us five branches which you can remember by a mnemonic stars. So what is the full form of the mnemonic stars then? Here we are looking at the right axilla region, the posterior cord of brachial plexus giving us stars, five branches in the axilla. So here are the posterior division which are passing behind the bone clavicle and uh, then joining to form the posterior cord of brachial plexus which will be then lying posterior to the axillary artery and then giving five branches. Its continuation is the radial nerve which is the nerve of posterior compartment. We have mentioned it earlier as well. Later it is going to follow the radius bone in the arm region. But in the stars, if R is the radial nerve, what is this? Upper S and lower S. These are the nerves which go under scapula, supply a muscle under scapula, the subscapularis muscle. So subscapularis muscle is a hybrid muscle supplied by two nerves. There is one upper subscapular nerve as you notice here and then there is one lower subscapular nerve also as you notice here. Now once you have mentioned upper and lower subscapular nerve, what is this? T for T is thoracodorsal nerve going dorsal to thorax supplying a muscle of lower back called latissimus dorsi. So this T is the thoracodorsal nerve which is going dorsal to the thorax and supplying this uh, muscle coming from the lower back called as latissimus dorsi. The muscle which is going to insert into the floor of the bicipital groove in the humerus bone. Then what is this A for? A is the axillary nerve. Let us zoom this area now and as you do that you will notice the axillary nerve is given from the posterior cord of brachial plexus 
in the axilla and then it will be passing through a quadrangular space and then it will be reaching the surgical neck of the humerus along with an artery called posterior circumflex humeral artery. We will be seeing all these details yet once again. But uh, here you have learnt Stars are the five branches given by posterior cordobrachial plexus in the axilla. In this section, we will be talking about some of the bones in the proximal region and uh, the corresponding joints. Here we'll be focusing upon the shoulder girdle made by the clavicle bone, scapula bone, and then we also have to talk about the humerus bone, radius ulna bone. In the same context, we will be briefly describing all the joints in the upper limb which are variously classified under different categories of joints, plain synovial joint, uniaxial, biaxial, multiaxial and we can talk about some of the ligaments, some of the muscles related with these bones. So let us begin with the classification of joints and their examples. And as we mentioned for the upper limb we have to talk about some of the bones like making the pectoral girdle or shoulder girdle we have the clavicle bone anteriorly scapula bone posteriorly. Then in the appendicular skeleton we have got the humerus bone a lateral bone radius, medial is the ulna. Then there are some hand bones. As you zoom here, you will find that there are eight carpal bones, four in the proximal row, and uh, next four in the distal row. There are five metacarpals for the five fingers. Each finger is then having three phalanges except for the first finger, that is the thumb, which has only two phalanges. Now let us talk about various joints in the upper limb. The joints are basically classified into the non-axial variety which you can consider as the plain synovial joint and then you can have uni, bi or multi-axial joints. In the uni-axial joint you can talk about the hinge joint and the pivot synovial joints whereas the bi-axial joint you have the condylar or ellipsoid synovial joint. It's bi-axial so four movements are possible like flexion, extension, adduction, abduction but then when it comes to multi-axial, like you have the saddle synovial joint or the ball and socket synovial joint, here you will have the third axis involved and not only there is flexion extension, abduction, adduction, but rotation is also possible, medial rotation, lateral rotation, as you see happening at the saddle synovial joint, first carpo metacarpal joint. Rotation is also possible at the shoulder joint, it is a multi-axial joint. So let us give an example of non-axial or plain synovial joint that can be seen in the carpus region, intercarpal joints, like you have the scaphoid lunate, triquetrum, they will have the plain synovial joint. And then what about the uniaxial joint? Uniaxial joint, you can talk about the hinge joint at the elbow. Elbow is a hinge joint and also interphalangeal joints. The PIP, the IP joints are also hinge joint. Hinge joints are strengthened by some collateral ligaments like you'll have radial collateral ligaments strengthening the elbow joint and ulnar collateral ligaments strengthening the elbow joint. Hinge variety of synovial joint. Now that is one Example for the uniaxial, that is the elbow joint considered to be the hinge joint or as you mentioned the interphalangeal joint. There is another uniaxial joint and that uniaxial joint is the pivot synovial joint. So in uniaxial you have two formats, one is the hinge variety of joint and the other is pivot synovial joint. And one good example is the radio ulnar joint. It is a joint between the radius and ulnar bone. There is a superior radial ulnar joint, there is one inferior radial ulnar joint and at this pivot synovial joint there is a vertical axis and the radius rotates over the ulna. So when the radius is rotating over the ulna, you have the supination and pronation occurring at the superior and inferior radio ulna joint, pivot synovial joint, rotatory synovial joint. They are uniaxial joints with one vertical axis. Then what about the biaxial variety? Under the biaxial variety, again we have two types. It could be condylar, it could be ellipsoid. Basically, condylar and ellipsoid 
are used interchangeably. The condylar joints will have condyles and the condyles will have elliptical surface. So it is condylar, ellipsoid, synovial joint, biaxial joint. For example, wrist joint and metacarpophalangeal joint, the knuckle joint. Both are considered as ellipsoid, synovial joint because their articular surface is elliptical. And then when it comes to multiaxial, you can mention the two types. One is the saddle synovial joint, the other is ball and socket synovial joint. And for that purpose, you can tell about the sternoclavicular joint as saddle synovial joint and also the first carpometacarpal joint as the saddle synovial joint. Actually here, the articular surfaces are reciprocally convexo-concave. One axis is convex and the other axis is concave in one particular bone and reciprocally the other bone is structured accordingly. Let us magnify this diagram of the first carpometacarpal joint which is a saddle synovial joint. You will notice the trapezium bone in the carpals articulating with the first metacarpal say x axis is having a concavity on the carpal bone whereas the y axis will be convex and reciprocally because the bones have to fit with each other the first metacarpal base of the first metacarpal will be structured accordingly. So if it was concave surface on the proximal bone, the distal bone will have a convex surface so that they can fit into each other. So saddle, synovial joint, the same thing you can find between the sternum bone and clavicle bone. Sternoclavicular joint is a saddle, synovial joint. And these joints are multi-axial joint, means they have more than two axes or you can say three axes are there. As I suggested earlier, the first carpal metacarpal joint can have one axis for flexion extension, one axis for abduction reduction, and then there is one axis which can help in medial rotation, lateral rotation of the thumb. So one additional vertical axis has come. That's why it is multi-axial joint. The same story goes with the shoulder joint. It is multi-axial synovial joint. So with the shoulder joint, you can find it's a ball and socket joint. The ball is the head of the humerus and socket is the glenoid cavity in the scapula. And it is a multi-axial joint. In one axis, there is flexion, folding of the shoulder joint and extension unfolding. Then in other axis, there is abduction reduction and then there's a third axis in which you can rotate the humerus bone. There can be a medial rotation, there can be a lateral rotation. So multi-axial joint. Shoulder joint is a very good example of multi-axial joint, but the mobility will come at the expense of uh, stability. If mobility is more, stability is less. Hence it is quite often dislocated joint. And then let us quickly revise the joints in the upper limb. What about the non-axial or plain synovial joint? That is the intercarpal joint like uh, scaphoid lunate triquetrum. And what about the uniaxial? Uniaxial can be a hinge joint, for example, the elbow joint or interphalangeal joint or uniaxial could be the pivot synovial joint. Like here we have Superior radial nerve joint and inferior radial nerve joint are pivot synovial joint. Then what about the biaxial, the condylar, which is more specifically called as ellipsoid synovial joint. Two examples, one is the wrist joint, it is ellipsoid synovial joint and the other is knuckle joint, which is metacarpophalangeal joint. So these are biaxial synovial joint. What about the multi-axial? Multi-axial, there are two types, saddle and ball and socket. For the saddle synovial joint, you have two examples. One is sternoclavicular joint, saddle synovial joint. And the other one is first carpometacarpal joint, which we have shown here. And then one more multi-axial, that is the ball and socket joint and none other than the shoulder joint. It is a multi-axial synovial joint. Then let us have a an overview of the surface marking of various bones in the proximal region and a correlating X-ray there. As you will notice, this is the medial end of the clavicle bone and that is the lateral end here. You can mark that here as well, the medial end of the clavicle and then the lateral end as well. There it will be making one acromioclavicular joint which is obviously 
with the scapula bone acromion process of the scapula. So as you notice, scapula is present on the posterior thoracic wall, sending one anterior process called as the acromion process, which you can see here, articular surface of the acromion process coming from the posterior scapula towards the anterior aspect, and that you can show here as well. This is the acromion articular process, which will be articulating with the clavicle bone, acromioclavicular joint, a plain synovial joint. Now, once we have discussed the acromion process of scapula, you have to talk about the coracoid process of scapula also, which is also one anterior projection from the posterior bone called scapula bone. So, scapula bone is sending one more anterior projection, which is called as the coracoid process in the infraclavicular fossa. And you can show it here. This is the coracoid process and lies below the clavicle, so infraclavicular fossa there. Then you can tell about some more features of the scapula bone. It is showing one glenoid cavity which will receive the head of the humerus for making the shoulder joint. So this is the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa which is at the lateral angle of the scapula. You can see this is going to be the lateral angle of the scapula, receiving the head of the humerus, making the shoulder joint. Now, scapula will have three angles and three borders. Not everything is evident here because the bones will be superimposed, but you can see one thing. The inferior angle of scapula is evident on the x-ray. And coming from the inferior angle of the scapula, you will find you are tracing the scapula towards the lateral angle. That will be the lateral border of the scapula. So here you can see from the inferior angle of scapula to the lateral angle of scapula, lateral angle is nothing but the glenoid cavity. You can mark the lateral border of the scapula. And on the other side, you'll have the medial border of the scapula. Since the bones are overlapping, it may not appear clear to you, but there is the superior angle of the scapula. Obviously, these angles you cannot show in this diagram because it is being overlapped by the ribs, the costal margin here, the lateral margin of the ribs, and those ribs will be overlapping the scapula bone posteriorly. You're just having one x-ray to make it clear. So, extending from the inferior angle of scapula to the superior angle of scapula, which border will be that? That will be the medial border of the scapula. So, here is the medial border of the scapula, reaching till the superior angle of scapula, and you can show it here, mark it here. Then you will notice, extending between the superior angle and the lateral angle, there will be a superior border of the scapula, and then you can mark it there. The superior border of scapula, which is not very evident, but you can just show it extending till the glenoid cavity, or the lateral angle of the scapula. Actually, it is from the superior border only that you are getting the coracoid process coming anteriorly. So that will be the superior border of the scapula. This is the lateral angle or glenoid cavity of the scapula and extending downward is the lateral border of scapula, which is shown here. So there are three angles and three borders. Lateral angle, inferior angle, superior angle, and then we have got superior border, the lateral border and medial border of scapula, seen from the front view in one x-ray. Then what about the humerus bone? Humerus bone will have head of the humerus, which is shown here articulating with the glenoid cavity to make the shoulder joint. And then the head of the humerus, when it continues with the upper end of the humerus, you'll find there is one anatomical neck of the humerus. Near that anatomical neck of the humerus is the attachment of the capsule of the shoulder joint, whose details we can see later, but here you can show this is going to be the anatomical neck of the humerus, and beyond that is the head of the humerus. Then, in the upper end of the humerus, you will have two tubercles, anteriorly lesser tubercle, posterior superiorly the greater tubercle. So, this is the anterior lesser tubercle, and posterior superiorly, that is the greater tubercle, which you can show here as well. Anteriorly, the lesser tubercle on the upper end of the humerus, and then you can also talk about the posterior superior, greater tubercle, which 
is marked here, but it can be seen more clearly on the posterior aspect of the humerus. Between the two, you'll have intertubercular sulcus or intertubercular groove. So that is the region of the intertubercular groove. And then we can show it here as well. Intertubercular groove. So that was just an overview to identify various landmarks for the upper limb. You can also see that the medial end of the clavicle will be making a saddle synovial joint with the sternum bone here, which is evident in the x-ray as well as in this diagram. This is the sternum bone receiving the clavicle bone, the sternoclavicular joint, a saddle synovial joint, multi-axial synovial joint. These uh, sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint will be helping us in shoulder movements like shoulder abduction, shoulder adduction, elevation of the scapula, depression of the scapula. The clavicle bone moves with that. There's a lateral rotation of scapula and there'll be a medial rotation of scapula with the abduction and adduction at the shoulder joint. And there can be some rotatory movement also. The clavicle rotates. So three axis of movement, multi-axial joint, saddle, synovial joint.